Go with me, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians. We've been on a topic for a few weeks now that we're calling uh, love over knowledge. In uh, 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about love, and then he talks about growing up. In verse 8, he said, love never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there be tongues, they'll cease. Whether there be knowledge, it'll vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. So he's talking about knowing what we know. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Said out loud, we know in part. We know in part. What does that mean? You don't know it all. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> huh? Help your neighbor. Look at him. Say, you do not know it all. <laughs> you, do, you don't. You don't. <laughs> what do they know? A part. Part. And uh, he goes on to say, um, verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So there is a, a parallel between natural development and spiritual development. When you're born again, spiritually, you're not born fully developed. You're born a spiritual baby, just like uh, when you're born naturally. First Peter said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And you will grow and develop if you're fed proper spiritual food and if you act on it. If not, you will not develop. You could have been born again 50 years ago and still be a baby right. spiritually. Yeah. And many are. You can't just go and listen to, uh, uh, you know, social reform and political views and, and you know, uh, well-known literature. It has to be the living Word of God anointed. That's the only thing that will feed your spirit. Other things might feed your intellect, might feed your emotions, but we're talking about spiritual development. You are a spirit being. You're not just a body. Your body is the house you live in. It's your dwelling. And you're not just a brain. You're not just a mind. People talk about mind and body like that's all there is. No, you are made in the likeness and image of God. He is spirit. Yes. And he is called the father of spirits. You're a spirit. Uh, you're looking at me right now through those two windows we call eyes. I see your house. I don't see you. You're in there. You're inside there. And you will exist after they bury this body. You'll still be you. You won't change into something else. You'll still be you. You'll even have memories of this life. Ms. I don't know if I, if I like that or not. <laughs> that's why, I believe that's one of the reasons why the Lord said he's going to wipe away all the tears from our eyes. After all of this life and even after all the judgments that follow, there's going to be a lot of things that's not pretty. But there's coming a point where God's going to do this for us. And it'll be no more. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more crying. No more dying. Yeah. Woo. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory. We're not there yet. But we're headed there. Amen. I said we're headed there. <laughs> that's a great thought though, isn't it? I mean, that's, woo. Mm. It's going to be wonderful. 
we, we've never been in a place like that. We've never lived like that. It's always been dark and pain. And I mean, <laughs> that was our introduction to this world. Somebody slapped us. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> and, we, and we start crying. Pain and crying. <laughs> Is that right? That's your introduction to this world. Welcome to earth. <laughs> uh, verse 12, he said, For now we see through a glass or a mirror, darkly or obscurely. Back then, they didn't have glass like we have. And mirrors would have been even like a silver plate that was polished to a high luster. Well, you can imagine that's not a perfect image, right? right? But that's your mirror. And so uh, you're, you see a reflection of you, but there's not much detail there. It's a blurry thing. And he said, that's our present view. Our present perspective is like that. That's how well we see things right now. That's how aware we are of what's really going on, which is back to we only know in parts. He's still talking about the same thing. Now I know in parts. He said it again. But then shall I know, even as also I am known. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. He goes on to say, now abides faith, hope, and, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So he's talking about knowing and knowing in part and then knowing more fully, but he winds up by saying that the greatest of all of this is not knowledge, it's love. Now go with me if you would, please. Over, We looked at this earlier, but I want to go further with it. In... Uh, 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. If you haven't been with us, let me encourage you to go, go online. Or if you're in the building, they'll give you a hard copy if, if you need that. Uh, and you can get the previous messages that we've talked about on this because we're building uh, on each one. And uh, what we saw in 1 Corinthians 8 and chapter 10 and Romans 14 was the emphasis of the Holy Spirit on the conscience. The conscience. We saw that the church at Corinth wrote to Paul and asked him questions. They asked him questions about marriage and divorce and these kind of things. They, they asked him questions about eating food offered to idols and you'll see in chapter 7 he answered one of the questions and then in chapter 8 he answered another question, 1 Corinthians. And they're wanting to know, okay, do we eat the food offered to idols or do we not? They're wanting a yes or no, do it or don't and that is not what he gave them. And more importantly, it's not what the Holy Spirit through him gave him. What he talked to them about was what they knew and didn't know and whether their conscience bothered them about it or not. And this hadn't been talked enough about in the church because man makes rules. Hmm? Oh, yeah, especially institutions. Oh, man, that's one of their main things. And one of the reasons why is so they can glory in them. This is our rules. Hmm? Our rules. You can do this. You can't do this. This is a sin. This is a worse sin. This is the worst sin of all. This is just a little sin. <laughs> huh? But did God say that? No. Well, who came up with that? Man. Oh, I got to watch out for this stuff. Because Jesus said that the traditions of men had made the word of God of no effect. 
Now you talk about a bad thing, right? Yes. What, what it is, it's a replacement for what he said. I had a lady come up one day after I'd spoken. It was in a small venue, and uh, uh, she, she didn't like something I said. And uh, she said, no, 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 now. She said, it's just like the song says. <laughs> I said, what? She said, like the song says. And she quoted me verse 2 of some unbelieving song that was in a hymnal. Yeah, yeah. Huh? And she believed that more than the five scriptures I just gave her. Preach it. Come on. Can you, you see what I'm talking about? So see, her traditional belief had made the word of God of no effect in her life. It didn't mean a thing to her like the song says. How about what the Bible says? Which is why. Everybody at Faith Life Church reads their chapter every day, Monday through Friday. Have you been reading about the offerings of the Lord and, and all those things? People, and some people say, yeah, I'm glad we don't have to do that. You're not reading it right. Everything in there is a beautiful picture of something that has been fulfilled in Christ, of the ways of God, his desires, his preferences. Do not ignore and do not neglect these things. Now, if you're with us and you say, well, I don't know what you're talking about, go by the information area uh, on your way out. They'll give you a little book card. We read a chapter each day, Monday through Friday, as a church family, and you'll find that you read the entire New Testament in one year's time doing that. And we've done that. We read the New Testament, what, three or four times? And now we're reading the Old Testament. We'll read it through, and then we'll read the New Testament several times, and then we'll do that again. But uh, it's, it's, it's sad how uh, little most church-going people know about the Bible. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. It is really pitiful. Right. And the, the reason it's a deal is because that makes you easy to fool. Right. It makes you easy to trick. How did Jesus combat the enemy during those 40 days and nights in the wilderness when he was bombarded with continual temptation? Tell me how. How did he do it? How? He said, it is written. And boy, it stopped that one. Then he said, it is written. And it stopped the other one. And so the devil says, you know, it's written. <laughs> Huh? The devil can quote scriptures too. But the master said, it's also written. And stop that way. Well, what if you don't know what's written? Then you got, you got no weapon in your hand. You're defenseless. And you don't know if somebody's lying to you or, or not. You don't know if it's right or if it's not. So please, church, seldom do you hear us asking you to do something. And as your pastors, we ask you, read your chapter. That's not for us. That's for you. Is that right? Yeah. Read, you know, now you, can, you want to do a lot more than that? Help yourself. But as a minimum, read that. How long does it take? You know, 20 minutes? Long chapter? It might take. Man, if you can't find that in a day, your priorities are not right for the word. So please uh, read your chapter. Now in uh, 2 Timothy, did you find that? Or uh, first, first, excuse me. No, you're right. First Timothy. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> That's what I'd said, right? First Timothy 4, we talked about conscience in those chapters I mentioned previously and how that the Spirit of God kept emphasizing and people say, well, you know, sin, sin, right? Uh, no, no, not according to the scripture. To him or her that knows, James says, to do good and does it not. To him, do you hear this language? To him or her, it's sin. Why not? I mean, sin is sin. No, 
Now, if something's wrong and you transgress it, it can cause you a problem. But that doesn't mean it was a sin to you if you didn't even know. And the Lord knows hearts. He is the heart knower. No one else knows your heart like him. Even you yourself don't know your own heart like he does. The Bible said, all things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What does that mean? You cannot fool God. You, you cannot convince him of something that's not true. He, he sees through everything. He sees right down into you. He knows not only uh, you know what you've done and hadn't done. He knows your intentions. He knows your intentions. He knows your motives behind what you do or didn't do. And so the only way to have a, a fellowship with him is to be completely honest, sincere, and open. And that, you know, everybody going to church nods their head and agrees with that. But we live in a world filled with lying. Lying, deception, phoniness. It's just everywhere. And it's contaminating. I said it's contaminating. It's defiling. It can get off on you more than you think. And you, you can say things you don't mean. Leave an impression you shouldn't leave. Exaggerate. Well, all of this is insincere. All of this is not honest. And that's a problem. Because what it does is it damages your conscience. And our conscience is the communication link between us, our spirit, and his spirit. In 1 Timothy 4 and 1, the spirit speaks expressly, specifically, exactly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines, that word devils is the word for demon, doctrines of demons, Notice the result. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. What's the result of that? Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now we talked about that uh, last week, that the word can, is also could be translated cauterized. Just like a branding iron that is red hot. And you, and you put a red hot branding iron on flesh, what happens? It, it sears it. it. It destroys it. Well then, um, if it's burnt badly enough and deeply enough and it recovers, it's not the same. It's thick and not sensitive. And can even have no sensation in the scar tissue and be unfeeling. Well, this is damage. This is serious damage. And he says that he's giving that as a graphic picture of what happens to the conscience when you're dishonest and you lie. Do you see that speaking lies in hypocrisy? Uh, every time I, I talk about this, you can just, you can sense that folks don't understand the seriousness of it. But one of the absolute worst things you and I could ever do is be dishonest or tell a lie. It does immediate damage to your insides, to your conscience, 
And what's the problem with that? That's how we hear from God. Our conscience is the communication connection between his spirit who's in us and our spirit. There's two persons living in this house. Me and the Holy Spirit. Same with you. That word conscience, it literally means co-knowing. Uh, you know, it's the word conscious is, is what it's akin to, its root. Conscience, and the Greek word means co, co-conscious. You can't have a co-pilot with one person. <laughs> huh? Co-author, co-captain. What's a co-witness? Your spirit is letting you know something, letting your mind know something, and somebody else inside you is letting you know if that's right or if that's wrong. Amen. We, we saw that in Romans 2 and Romans 9 that uh, his spirit, he said, bears witness in the Holy Spirit. And then he said, uh, talking about conscience, that the conscience either confirms or refuses it either gives you a witness that yeah, this is good, this is okay, or it's a check. No, something's wrong with this. And you've heard people say sometimes when they made a mistake, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done that. How could you have known the future, something and an outcome? Well, you have somebody in you who knows the future, who knows everything about everything. And he lets us know things, not through audible voices and not through physical feelings and sensations, but through a co-knowing. Is your conscience important, child of God? Do you want your conscience seared and dull and unfeeling so that you can do stuff that's terrible and your heart doesn't even bother you anymore? That means you're in bad, bad shape. You are far from God. You want a tender conscience. You want a clear conscience. You want a clean conscience. Can you say amen? amen? We talked some about that. How do I get a clear conscience and how do I keep a clear conscience? Well, man, that's a, there's a whole study in that. Number one, Hebrews 9 talks about this. Hebrews 10 I don't have time to go through all this. That's why I keep giving you the chapters. If you want to write them down and read them, it'll, it'll help you on this. Tells us the only thing in all the world that can cleanse a conscience. There's one thing, only. No amount of psychotherapy can cleanse a conscience. The world can tell you, just ignore it, forget about it, that's just some of your old, you know, uh, Victorian beliefs. That's some of your old religious things that your parents pushed off on you, everything. No, if your heart's bothering you about something, that's not me bothering you. That's not them bothering you. That's you on the inside. And if you're a believer, you can trust this because there's somebody else on the inside of you co-witnessing with that. And oh, we need to trust this. That's why the Bible said, uh, you know, to him that knows to do good, does it not sin? But Romans 14 says, whatever's not of faith is sin. One translation says, whatever's done without a sense of its approval by God, without this confidence, we must not ignore what bothers us in our conscience. We must not override it, and we must not be dishonest about what we see and know. And we certainly must not lie about it, or else you do damage to your own conscience. There's a searing 
a damaging process that happens, the more dishonest one is, the longer they go hiding about it, lying about it, being dishonest about it, there is this searing, this desensitizing, this damaging, which means you get, anybody, me, you, whoever that's doing it, gets dollar and dollar and dollar as far as hearing from God. And it's possible to keep going until your conscience is completely seared and you can do despicable things and it don't even bother you. And the enemy is always trying to do this to us. There's, it's not, not by accident that TV shows, movies, articles, all this kind of stuff, stuff on the, on the web, has gotten more and more profane, vulgar, blasphemous, violent. Why? Because if you'd never heard any of that and your heart's tender and you heard, you know, cussing and taking the Lord's name in vain and using off of your heart would go, oh, oh, eh, no. Or if you saw, you know, uh, human beings being destroyed and decapitated and also known as a zombie movie. You'd go, oh, oh, mm, mm. But the enemy's plan is to get you desensitized, to get you to hear it until you, you still don't like it, but you tolerate it. And the problem is, toleration is a step toward conformity. You're not there yet. But the enemy don't mind working on you for 40 years. He'll work on you for 40, 50, 60 years in the same thing. And just, he, you know, it, all you got to do is just start ignoring your conscience. Just start ignoring it and then you can ignore it a little more and a little more. And some things happen over years. But it's not being honest about what you see. It's not being honest about what we know. Now, like what we had said before, last week, you know, I said I used to work out on the docks loading freight. Uh, and, and my hands got calloused doing that. It, it's hard manual work. And, uh, but that was, you know, decades ago. And now I got no calluses at all. <laughs> Little tender hands. <laughs> What am I saying? Though something had become calloused and thick and unfeeling, that doesn't mean it can't change. Amen. And it can't, it can't change back. Why did my hands become tender again? I stopped doing what was damaging them. Can you see that? I stopped doing and they became tender and sensitive again. And thank God the Lord can heal things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go with me if you would. Go, go to Matthew 9. Matthew 9 and 9. As Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Now this was tax collection. And he said to him, he said to the tax collector, Matthew, follow me. Now that doesn't mean for the next few minutes. Hmm? That means we're making a life change here. Right? Follow me. And he got up right then and left his money table and all that stuff and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat or food in the house. And so apparently he went back to, he went back to Matthew's house. Many publicans tax collectors, and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. Now, <laughs> tax collectors <laughs> have not always been the most beloved, even in recent times. 
<laughs> but back then, oh, they were hated because many of them were crooked and they padded your bill, your tax bill, that they pocketed the difference. And it was already a burden. It was already tough on the people. Maybe you owed $1,000 and you knew that and you show up and they say you owe 1500 But when did that change? And you better not make a scene because there's Roman soldiers standing around. Right? You got no choice. You pay the 1500 and the tax collector pockets 500 of it. They were hated. And so a bunch of these guys show up at Matthew's house with Jesus and other folks whom the Bible calls sinners. Is that right? If the Bible calls you a sinner, you a sinner. Is that right? Tax collectors and sinners. This is not a Bible study. <laughs> and the Pharisees, when they saw it, they cornered Jesus' disciples and they said, why is your master eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said to them, they that be whole, uh, they don't need a physician. The sick need a doctor. Not people that are doing good. And uh, he said, but go and learn what that meant. This is a, a quote from the Old Testament. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I'm not come to call the righteous. They're already in good shape. But sinners to repentance. Hallelujah. Now we talked about this in John 7 on one of our earlier lessons that we saw the woman that was caught in the act of adultery that they came and threw down in front of Jesus and they said, the law says stoner. What do you say? And you remember that he, uh, he stooped down, wrote on the ground as though he didn't even hear them and then he rose up and said, he that's without sin among you, let him cast or throw the first stone. And it says one by one, they, the, the religious leaders that was accusing this woman, one by one, they left being, uh, you know, convicted by their own conscience. You remember that? This is all in John 7, I believe it is. Uh, or eight, whichever one it was. Uh, when the, they're all gone and the woman's standing there in the midst, Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? Now see, she still doesn't know whether she's off the hook or not. And she says, no man, Lord. And basically he said, not me either. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What we see here is compassion, but not compromise. Because there is a twisting today of God's love and mercy and a push to accept everybody and everything they're doing. That if you love them, you will accept them and what they do and who they are. Did Jesus do that? No, no he did not. He did not. Say, say it out loud, compassion. Compassion. But not, but not compromise. Did he have compassion on this woman? Yes. Yeah, he did. He said, I'm, I'm not, not going to judge you. you. You don't have to, well, let me say it like this. You can preach truth and righteousness without being judgmental. Right. Yes, hmm? Yes. 
without being judgmental. But that doesn't mean you call wrong right. He called what she had done sin. Didn't he? He called it sin. He didn't tell her she's okay. He didn't tell her it wasn't a big deal. It was a big deal. Why would the law command that people be stoned for it? A death sentence? To show how damaging it is. How bad it is. It destroys people. It destroys families. It destroys children. It destroys households. And back then, people not even born again. You couldn't tell them, be led by the Spirit. The only deterrent they had was fear of punishment. Now, thank the Lord, we've been delivered from fear of punishment. The Lord has taken our place. But that doesn't mean you, you belittle sin and say it's no big deal. It's why Jesus had to go to the cross. It's a huge deal. I said it's a huge deal. And so the only solution is repentance. And a lot of folks don't even like that word anymore in church. And people have kind of done away with the word sin. And now people just have problems. <laughs> they have problems. They have a problem with this. And they're working on it. What, what does that mean? What it often means is that people are sinning. And they have not yet repented. And there's no excuse for that. There's forgiveness for it. But there's no excuse for it. And the problem comes right back to conscience. If you know you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. If you know you're not doing something you should be doing. There's no excuse for just going on month after month and, and year after year. And the problem is... Everything down here in this life is time sensitive. There will not be endless opportunities to repent. There will not be endless uh, opportunities to make it right, to get it right. There are people that have grown up in church who, who haven't given their heart to the Lord and they're not going to church, and they're putting it off. They're thinking, well, maybe, you know, when I get older, but, well, what if you die today? Hmm? As so many will. Scores of thousands of people all over this planet will die today in the next 24 hours. And I assure you, many of them, as they're breathing their last, one of the big thoughts that they'll have is, I thought I had more time. I thought I had, I thought I would have. You're not guaranteed, especially not based on your performance. <laughs> It'll be the mercy of God and the grace and help of the Lord for you and I to make a full length of life. Only with his help will that happen. And if we're not listening to him, if we're ignoring him, the Bible said, the psalmist said, bloody and deceitful men will not live out half their days. That's what it said. Thank God, I like this scripture. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Do you know that's the only time you ever live in? Huh? You never live in yesterday, and you can't live in tomorrow, because when tomorrow gets here, what will it be? Today. It'll be today. The only time you have ever done anything is now, today. And now is the accepted time to what? To, to get to God, to believe. Yes. And if you've messed up, repent. Get it right. Can you say amen? Get, get it right now. 
Anything that's bothering your conscience, get it up. I, I know people are afraid. They're afraid uh, to confess. They're afraid to make it right. Well, people won't like me. Well, people will leave me. Uh, well, if they do, God will still be with you. <laughs> but there's something worse than just maintaining the status quo. And that's your conscience getting more dull by the day. That is not how God intended for us to live. So when it says they said you'd eaten with publicans and sinners, Jesus didn't eat with them to tell them everything they're doing is okay. What did he say? I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to what? To tell them everything's all right? To call them to repent. Amen. Now this is not what the world is saying. Heard somebody on a talk show a while back and they were trying to grill a, a, a well-known pastor. And uh, they were saying, how can a God who is love send people to a hell? And they said, and, and talking about, you know, problems that some things that people call sin. And said, well, didn't Jesus preach love and acceptance? And everybody around the table nodded their head. And the Spirit of God inside me this was a few years ago. Right. Spirit of God inside me, the Lord said, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. It's not what I preached. I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> what did, uh, they say, that sounds good though, doesn't it? Right, right. What did Jesus preach? He preached love and acceptance. How many people would go, yeah, yeah. But if you look at the scriptures, he preached repentance. Right. He preached the kingdom of God and repentance. Repentance, acceptance, about the same? No. <laughs> no. No, Jesus did not preach acceptance. He preached repentance, which is what? Acknowledging what you see, acknowledging what you know, and coming to him. Can you say amen? amen? Go with me to Titus. We're running out of time here. In Titus, verse, uh, uh, chapter 1 and, and verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure, but to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their what? Conscience, Conscience is what? Defiled. Defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work uh, reprobate or disapproved, rejected. Um, we said everything down here is time sensitive. There's a window where you can do it and then there's going to be a time when that window is passed and it'll be too late. It's portrayed by Noah and the ark and the flood. There was a time, years, Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he preached to the people that the flood was coming and uh, people didn't believe him. They mocked him and they made fun of him ridiculed him and uh, they, they had not seen rain like we know it and so all the experts I'm sure and the meteorologists and the climatologists <laughs> said it couldn't happen until it started and God shut the door is that right? Well, yes. God shut the doors on the ark. What, what's that representative of? The time was over. The time when you could get in. And no doubt there were people who screamed and clawed at the doors and tried to swim as long as they could to get to it. But Noah couldn't open the door. Huh? The time had passed. And 
uh, in, in Revelation talking about Jezebel. It, it, the Lord said, I gave her and them, those that are with them, space to repent. That word space is also translated time. A period of time to repent. And if you read in Revelation, it, 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 as the judgments begin to come, there were people who had, who had seen all kind of things wiped out by judgment, and it said, yet they would not repent. And even though they saw this and experienced this, they still would not repent. What's that telling you? There comes a point when people are not going to change. What has happened? They have seared their conscience. They have dulled themselves to the point. It doesn't bother them anymore. And they have no respect for God, no love for God. Oh, Lord, help us to never get like that. Right? And the, the, the prodigal son, you remember the young boy took his inheritance and went off and spent it on riotous living. And I want you to notice something. The father did not chase him. Did the father love this boy? We know he did from reading the rest of the passage. Did, did, did he go and beg him to come home? No, not one time do we have anything like that. Why? Why? It would have done no good. Why? Because he wasn't ready to repent. It would have done no good. But when the, the boy at the pig pen, <laughs> sometimes people got, pretty, got to get pretty low to, to, to come to himself. He said he came to himself. He came to us. Well, what was, what was going on with him before? He's in some kind of a haze, some kind of a uh, uh, stupidness. <laughs> now, you're laughing, but sin will make you stupid. Don't raise your hand, but you know you have done stupid stuff. We've done, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory. We've done stupid stuff. And the further you go, the more stupid you get. But he came to himself and he thought, what am I doing? I'm out here starving. Try, about to join Arnold here in the trough <laughs> for lunch. <laughs> he said at home. Daddy's hired hands eat good. What am I doing? I am going to go back to my father. Oh, friend, this is a perfect picture of repentance. This is repentance. This is repentance. I'm going back to my father. I'm going to say, Daddy, I have sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve anything, but could you just make me like one of you? your hired hands. And he turns around with the full intention of saying those things. But when the father saw him coming, is that right? He ran to me. Was he wanting the boy to come home all the time? Did he love him? Why didn't he chase him? It would have done no good. Why not beg him? It would have done no good. Why? Because the boy is not listening to his own conscience. And if people are not listening to their own conscience and they're being dishonest with their self, don't be shocked when they won't listen to you. Amen. Oh, but the moment he comes to himself, he says, what am I doing? How stupid have I been? I'm going home. I'm going back to Papa's house. I'm, hmm? And, and the Bible said, when the father saw him afar off, before he even got close to the house, he runs and meets him and hugs him, pig stink and all. Is that right? Hugs him, pig stink and all. And the boy goes into his speech and says, Daddy, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I sinned against God. I sinned against you. I'm no worthy. I'm not worthy to be your son. He says, shh, 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 shh. I, I know, I know, I know. 
come on in. And, and, and he brought him to the house and he said, go and get us some of that, that special veal that we've been saving up. And go into my closet and, and get that $8,000 suit, you know, the, 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 the pinstripe one. And, and get those alligator shoes. And get the, am I making this up? Get that diamond ring, is that right? And get, get that big bracelet that I like and come and put it on him because this my son, he was dead and now he's back. He's alive. He was gone, but he has returned. This is repentance and it's glorious and it's life. Hallelujah. It's life, it's deliverance, it's restoration, it's a gift of God. And it's how you get and keep your conscience clear. Everybody stand on your feet.